Uh, anyway, we should have a moon base alpha, which is the next step after the Apollo program would be to have a base on the moon. After 56 years, humanity has the chance to return to the moon. But this time, ambitions go far beyond collecting rocks and planting flags. We're aiming to establish a permanent base, one that allows humans to live, work, and conduct research directly on the lunar surface. SpaceX has its own vision for this bold new chapter, Moon Base Alpha. But what will it actually look like? And could it be the key that unlocks a new era in space exploration for all of humankind? Technically, the moon base we're preparing to build won't be the first human base on the lunar surface. During the Apollo missions, astronauts established six temporary outposts, beginning with Tranquility Base. However, these so-called bases were more like short-term landing sites or field camps, rather than actual infrastructure capable of supporting sustained human or robotic activity. To date, the only instances of humans living on the moon have occurred inside the Apollo lunar modules, where astronauts stayed for a few days at a time, such as during the Apollo 17 mission. One of the major challenges faced by those early lunar crews was lunar dust. It clung stubbornly to their suits and was carried into the cabin where astronauts could smell and even taste it. They described the scent as similar to gunpowder, often referring to it as the Apollo aroma. This fine dust is not only pervasive, but also potentially hazardous to human health. So can SpaceX's moon base overcome the challenges of the past and become humanity's first true permanent outpost on the moon? Building a moon base from the ground up would require the efforts of hundreds of people, years of planning and development, and the transport of vast amounts of infrastructure to the lunar surface. Fortunately, SpaceX may not need to go through all that. They already have a multi-purpose vehicle, Starship, designed to carry both cargo and humans to the moon and Mars. In SpaceX's vision, Starship itself could become the moon base. The concept revolves around repurposing the vehicle's large volume, particularly the empty fuel tanks, into robust space habitats. While this approach could apply to any large rocket body, the SpaceX Starship Human Landing System, HLS, offers several unique advantages. First and foremost, Starship is enormous. Even in its current form, its internal volume exceeds that of the entire International Space Station. Repurposing its fuel tanks would add even more habitable space, potentially rentable to other space agencies or commercial entities, to generate revenue and promote sustainable growth. Additionally, Starship's stainless steel construction makes it relatively easy to modify. We already have extensive experience working with this material, even in space environments. Since Starship was originally designed to carry up to 100 people on long-duration missions to Mars, it is already engineered to support life in space for extended periods. The biggest advantage of this plan is that it relies mostly on existing technologies and requires only limited modifications of the vehicle. One of these modifications includes a type of rover which would assist in deploying equipment and transitioning Starship from its vertical landing orientation to a horizontal position, a key step I'll explain in more detail later. The mission to convert the vehicle into a permanent lunar base is expected to take about two to three months. During this operation, two starships, one crewed and one carrying supplies, will travel to the surface of the moon. The uncrewed supply starship will launch from Earth first, carrying all the necessary equipment, tools, materials, systems, and provisions required to construct and sustain the future base. The crew, responsible for building the base, will launch shortly afterward aboard a separate starship. Both spacecraft will rendezvous in Earth orbit to refuel before performing the translunar injection burn. The crewed starship must support the astronauts not only during the journey to and from the moon, but also during the initial weeks on the lunar surface, until the base becomes habitable. The planned landing site is the lunar south pole, specifically along the rim of Shackleton Crater. The peaks along the crater's rim receive near-continuous sunlight, while the interior remains in permanent shadow. This unique environment creates a cold trap within the crater, where volatiles released by comet impacts may have accumulated and frozen over time. Data from NASA's Lunar Prospector spacecraft revealed unusually high concentrations of hydrogen in the crater, strongly suggesting the presence of water ice. This resource is crucial for supporting a long-term lunar base, providing potential sources for drinking water, breathable oxygen, and even rocket fuel through electrolysis. It is important to note that the two Starship vehicles will need to land at least 5 kilometers apart. This distance is based on the assumption that it will minimize the risk of dust and debris being kicked up during the propulsive landing, which could damage the other spacecraft. The crew will remotely operate a fleet of robots that will handle the transition of the lunar base. I mean, of course, it's the 21st century. Humans don't do that kind of thing anymore. 
Besides, there's only so much you can do in those bulky EVA suits and a hand shovel. Starship will land vertically on the lunar surface, but after that, we're going to lay the ship down on its side. This makes it way more convenient to modify into a moon base. Most of the equipment needed for construction will already be stored inside the uncrewed vehicle when it arrives, so the crew only needs to bring their own life support systems, such as suits and extra supplies, along with any additional transportation like rovers. After the horizontal maneuver, the remaining methane will be completely drained and stored in a designated bladder. The internal pressure of the vehicle will be kept high enough to maintain structural integrity, but low enough to reduce unnecessary mass. The vehicle will then be positioned between two parallel ridges of piled regolith to keep it stable and prevent rolling. At that point, the crew can officially enter the base for the first time. Using specialized cutting tools and safety procedures, they will cut openings in the fuel tank domes and install hatches. Over the next several weeks, they will unpack the payload and begin transforming the inside of the tanks into a livable space. That includes installing insulation for thermal and radiation protection, building floors and walls, setting up life support systems, electrical wiring, ventilation, communication systems, lighting, heat removal systems, water tanks and plumbing, bathrooms, showers, and yes, furniture. They will also deploy the observation deck from the airlock facing Earth because no matter how far you go, it is always important to remember where you came from. In the final step, we need to cover the entire structure with a three meter thick layer of lunar regolith. Every day, thousands of ping pong ball sized meteorites pose a threat to our moon base. That's one of the reasons the moon's surface looks so rough and patchy. This thick layer of lunar soil will not only protect us from incoming meteorites, but will also act as an extra shield against the extreme temperatures and radiation found in the lunar environment. So, we have a home on the moon to live in. But having a lunar base is just the first step. The lunar environment presents a lot of challenges that astronauts don't face while floating around weightlessly on the ISS. One of the biggest problems, as I mentioned earlier with the Apollo 17 mission, is dust. Lunar regolith comes in a range of particle sizes, and at the smallest scale, the dust is fine enough to be inhaled, which poses a real health risk to the crew. On top of that, lunar surface materials carry an electrical charge due to constant bombardment from cosmic and solar radiation, which can add toxicity issues into the mix. The problems don't stop there. Lunar dust sticks to everything, spacesuits, tools, even inside the habitat, and it easily gets tracked into places you definitely don't want it. Inhalation of these particles can lead to serious health problems, including chronic respiratory conditions. To address the hazards posed by lunar dust, comprehensive dust management systems and continuous monitoring of crew exposure, particularly in the lunar extravehicular activity LEVA, environment, are essential. Effective systems should incorporate advanced mitigation techniques such as electrostatic and dielectrophoretic dust removal technologies. Additionally, the implementation of airlocks with enhanced seals, rigorous cleaning protocols, and controlled ingress and egress procedures can significantly reduce dust infiltration. Well-designed donning and doffing procedures for suits and equipment will further help minimize the spread of lunar dust within the rover and habitat environments. Prolonged exposure to hypogravity can lead to a range of physiological and psychological issues, including altered immune response, impaired sensory motor and vestibular function, cognitive and behavioral disorders, decreased bone density, muscle atrophy, and reduced cardiovascular performance. These effects can significantly impact an astronaut's ability to carry out mission-critical tasks. To effectively mitigate these risks, the astronaut construction crew should follow a structured exercise regimen that includes resistance training, aerobic workouts, and high-intensity interval training. Equipment such as treadmills, rowing machines, and cyclergometers should be incorporated into the lunar base. Additionally, designated space should be allocated for plyometric exercises to enhance bone strength, neuromuscular coordination, and cardiovascular health. Group exercise sessions should also be encouraged to foster team cohesion, promote psychological well-being, and provide social and recreational benefits. Space radiation is another major risk during lunar surface activities with both immediate and long-term effects on astronaut health. The primary sources include high-energy particles from deep space, solar storms, and secondary particles created when radiation interacts with lunar soil. 
Data from China's Chang'e 4 lander shows radiation levels on the moon are about 2.6 times higher than on the International Space Station. A strong solar storm can cause acute radiation sickness affecting the brain, immune system, skin, internal organs, and overall mission performance. Long-term exposure increases the risk of DNA damage and other chronic health issues. The best current protection strategies include limiting time spent outside the habitat and continuously monitoring individual radiation exposure. Space agencies have set strict radiation limits for both yearly missions and lifetime exposure. Emergency procedures are essential in case a solar storm occurs during surface activity. Because these storms can develop quickly, astronauts must be able to reach shelter within 30 minutes to stay within safe exposure limits. Establishing a moon base is a major milestone in humanity's journey to explore the moon and the wider solar system. However, this is just the beginning. Looking further ahead, concepts like the moon village have been proposed. This open and inclusive vision would support all kinds of lunar activities, robotic missions, astronaut operations, 3D printed habitats, refueling stations, relay satellites, astronomy, resource utilization, and even tourism. The goal is to foster coordination, leverage synergies, and build a permanent, sustainable presence on the lunar surface, whether robotic or crude. Moon Village aims to create a platform where international cooperation and space commercialization can flourish together. This initiative represents a crucial first step in uniting humanity, developing partnerships, and building the expertise needed before taking on more ambitious goals like Mars exploration. But for now, our focus remains on establishing our very first home on the moon. If you've made it this far, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us create even more great content. Thanks so much and see you in the next video, space enthusiasts.